go to this link and download the file because we'll be using it for later. Yeah, it's not, so it's just any URL, workshop valuation methods. Okay, right. Okay, so today, like what I said, we're going to do equity research valuation methods. So I should preempt all of you that this will be a, a really basic run through of all the different methods. So for all of you that are already quite familiar with valuation methods, uh, please bear with us. Right. Okay, the disclaimer. So um, whatever you hear today, um, please do read up on your own as well as do your own research before you make any decisions. Okay, so here's the agenda for today. We are going to introduce you to the valuation methods, which are mainly the DCF analysis as well as the public public comparables of public forms. And then we're going to do the other methods and then lastly the conclusion. Right. So, what are valuation methods? Video time. How do you choose the best stock valuation method? There is no single valuation tactic that works for all stocks in every situation. But a company's characteristics provide clues to investors about the best method to use. Valuation models are usually absolute or relative. Absolute methods look for the true value of an investment based on a company's fundamentals, like the dividends it pays or its cash flow. Valuation models include the dividend discount model, the discounted cash flow model, and others. The dividend discount model calculates the present value of a firm's stock based on the dividends it pays. This only works for stocks that pay stable and predictable dividends, which are typically mature blue chip companies. If the model shows a stock's present value is more than its market value, it's a good time to buy that stock. The discounted cash flow model may work for stocks that don't pay a dividend. It looks at the present value of a firm's future cash flow to determine a fair value for its stock. It works best for firms that are past their growth stages. Relative valuation models operate by comparing the company in question to similar companies. These methods generally involve calculating multiple score ratios, such as the price to earnings or price to book ratio, and comparing them to benchmarks and the ratios of other firms. The bottom line is each stock is different, as is each industry. Many investors will perform several valuations to create a range of possible values, or an average, to determine the stock's true value. Okay, so does everybody know, like, to sum up what valuation methods are? <coughs> okay, if that's so, then, um, uh, we have come to the end of our presentation. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. Okay, so, what are valuation methods? So, you know that often the price of a stock does not actually reflect the true value of the company. <laughs> so, we do valuation methods in order to measure the worth, the true worth of the company, so that we can make informed financial decisions. Okay, so is the company overvalued, undervalued, or fairly valued? So we're going to start off with the DCF analysis, which is what they say the absolute valuation, followed by the relative valuation, which is what comes, and the other more specific valuation methods. Okay, so for those of you who haven't downloaded it, this is the link, tinyurl.com slash workshop valuation methods. Okay. So we're going to do, I'm just going to tell you some steps, and after that we're going to go to the model. So the DCF analysis serves to kind of model the current value of the company based on its projected future cash flows, which is its cash flows in the future. So after we've done that, right, we have to discount it back because of the time value of money. We have to take into account things like inflation. So the value of money today is larger than the value of money tomorrow. So you have to discount it back. And then the last point, the present value will be the discounted future cash flows plus the discounted terminal value. I'll talk more about terminal value later, right? Okay. So you go to the model. This is going to be quite step by step. And just saying the valuation, the, the numbers that we use are actually quite simple because for the sake of clarity, because we want to focus on the concepts as well as the formulas. So we try to make everything simple. But in real life, obviously it won't be that simple. But we are focusing on the concepts. So you get you go to the income statement, you can easily get all these numbers from your 3FS, and then we will start with EBIT. 
which is your earning before interest and tax. And then we also have other values that you can get from our 3FS, which is our net operating working capital or NOWC for short, the change in net operating working capital and your capex or your capital expenditure. So let's start from step one. So step one, you have your EBIT, right? So you want to remove the tax portion of it. So what you do is that you take EBIT times one minus the tax rate. So all, the, all these assumptions are laid out over here. You can go and find them. Next time you're doing your own model, you have to make certain assumptions. You can, depends on your source. So for sake of simplicity, these are the assumptions. So your tax rate in this case will be your corporate tax rate, which is 18%. So you just simply take EBIT times one minus 18%. So you'll get all these values over here. So that's step one. So step two, you have to add back your DNA, which is your depreciation and amortization. So we add it back because it's a non-cash expenditure. And then lastly, you have to minus your capex as well as your change in net operating working capital. So this will be the formula. Everyone clear so everyone with me so far up to this step? Yeah, if you have any questions, just and just raise your hand anytime. Okay. So you will get your free cash flows over here. So we completed that already. So the terminal value is the value of the company if it were to continue on at a stable at, um, at a stable growth rate. So it's like what's the value of the company beyond its projected years of cash flow. <coughs> so there are two methods of calculating the terminal value. The first of which is the Gordon growth method or the growth perpetuity method. And the next one will be the exit multiple method. So for the Gordon Growth Method, it assumes that the company will continue to run its business and generate cash flows at the long-term growth rate into, perpet into perpetuity. Whereas for the exit multiple method, we are just simply using that a multiple such as EV over EBITDA and then you times the EV of the, the EBITDA of the final projected year to get your, your, value, your terminal value. So over here, the formulas are this. For the exit multiple method, it's just simply okay. It's a bit complicated. I can show it to you here. Yeah, here. For the exit multiple method, right? It's just the EBITDA of the final projected year times the multiple, which in this case is EV over EBITDA. For the Gordon Growth method, it will be your cash flows for the last projected year times one plus the long-term growth rate, which is in our assumptions here, 2%, and <coughs> divided by WEC minus long-term growth rate. So over here, if you select the exit multiple method, it will be 8,000, and the Gordon growth method, it will be this number instead. Okay, so do take note that for now, right, the free cash flows and the terminal value are both not discounted, so we have to discount them back, the present value. So in order to do that, we have to use a discounting rate, which is normally the WEC, or the weighted average cost of capital. So the WEC over here consists of debt, cost of debt and cost of equity. So what does it mean, cost of debt and cost of equity? For the cost of debt, right, very loosely, it can be referred to as the interest rate of the debt. But however, in this case, right, because of the significant tax shields on interest expense, you have to actually incorporate the corporate tax rate inside. So you have to take out the corporate tax rate. So instead of um, instead of the debt rate of interest rate of eight percent, right? The interest rate will instead be eight percent times one minus the corporate tax rate. So that will be your cost of debt. For cost of debt, there's not a lot of uh, arguments about cost of debt. It's rather straightforward. But the complicated one is the cost of equity, which actually refers to 
the risk free rate which plus the beta times market risk premium. So what this entire formula means is that the risk free rate is something like the safest rate or what you can get from like a bond or even a fixed deposit. The beta is how volatile the stock is compared to the market and then the market risk premium is just simply the risk free rate minus the market returns. Oh sorry, market return minus risk free rate. Sorry. So for the sake of simplicity, we just put set it as 10% for now, but it might differ. So how are we going to find out the weights for each of them? Because it's weighted. We find the total debt, which is under our assumptions here, and the total equity, which is the price of the stock times the number of outstanding shares. So we get total debt, total equity, so our total capital will just be the sum of the two. So you calculate the weight of debt by taking total debt divided by total capital. And for equity, we do the same. Total equity divided by total capital. So our weight will just be a weighted average of, the, of both of them. So it will be debt, the weight of debt times the cost of debt plus the weight of equity times the cost of equity. And in this case, we get 8.9%. So we have our discount rate. Then we come here. So now, what we do is that we have our discount rate, we have our, uh, we have our values of free cash flow, as well as our terminal value. We can discount it using this formula. So it will be free cash flow divided by 1 plus WEC to the degree of the projection period. So for example, if it's the first year, it will be your free cash flow divided by 1 plus your WEC to the power of 1. And we do the exact same thing for the terminal value. So we get the present value of free cash flows as well as the present value of the terminal value. So we sum all of this up to get the enterprise value, which is actually the value that is attributed to creditors as well as shareholders. However, you just want to find out the value that is attributable to shareholders. So what we do is that we minus the debt from the enterprise value. In this case, we get the, the equity value which is the value that is attributable to shareholders only. So we divide that by the number of shares outstanding and we get the expected price per share. So you compare that with the current share price and you can make you can use that as a factor in your decision making. So if you edit any of the values here, right, you will get different results. So for example, if I were to edit the exit multiple, I'll get different results, or if I were to edit the number of shares, yeah, you get different results. So your assumptions are quite important in determining the final expected price per share. Okay, so last few things to highlight, right? The output is highly sensitive to inputs because most of the inputs are based on future assumptions. So normally you want to use this method for companies which are more stable and then they actually have a more steady, predictable cash flow because it really relies on future assumptions. Okay? Yeah. So uh, without further ado, I'll pass the time on to Jerry who will tell you more about how it comes. Okay, thanks Nick. So next we move on to co uh, public comparables. So for the comparable company analysis, it involves the analysis of similar companies in the industry to estimate the worth of the company. So usually what we do first is we select the comparable company which must be publicly traded and also um, in, within a similar industry or the same industry. Then after that we calculate the multiples such as the EV over EBITDA, PE ratio, PV ratio and the price to earnings growth ratio before estimating the takeover price. Then after that, when, uh, when you are selecting the comparable public companies, you have to consider the location of the company, the business model environment, and also the size of the company. So all this reli the reliability of all these estimates right, will depend on your si similarity of the company to that of the counterparts in the industry. Okay. Yeah, so this is the example of a public comparables. So this one is the, the diff, okay, this was the median, mean, median, low, high based on the companies that you are compared with. Then after that, from there, you can see if like 
the multiples is higher than a certain mean or median, the company might be overvalued. Then after that, you look at the share price at the bottom based on the multiples. Yeah. Yeah, so as I said just now, the reliability of this estimate will be depending on the similarity of the company to its counterparts. So there are other valuation methods also, like uh, pre precedent transactions, net asset valuation, M&A premiums, some of the parts, and leverage buyout analysis. So I'll just briefly run through them. So for precedent transactions, it is based on the premise that the value of the company can be calculated by analyzing the previous <coughs> M&A deals, uh, previous prices paid by purchasers of their similar companies in similar circumstances as the indicator of the company's value. So these are also known as the M&A comparables. So the valuations tend to be higher than that of public comps, like as, uh, the valuation method I used just now. So it includes the, because it includes the premiums paid to acquire the company. So we will say that the precedent transactions are less reliable if the company previously acquired was a private company, so it's even harder to get information regarding the company. And also if the transaction occurred too far back, so it might not be indicative of the current market conditions. So as for net asset valuation, the net asset value is obtained after you deduct the total liabilities of the company from the total fair market value of its assets to determine the net asset value. So if you actually divide this by the number of outstanding shares, you actually can measure the value of one share per fund so that investors can actually compare the fund's performance with the market or industry benchmark also. So more often than not, the asset acquisition cost stated in the balance sheet might not reflect the current asset value. So this asset should be reviewed in order to calculate their fair market value. So for M&A premiums, it's similar to precedent transactions. But instead of comparing the valuation multiples, this method compares the premiums paid for similar companies instead of the entire like actual price you pay for the company. So it's often used for valuing startups like your tech companies. So next we have the sum of the parts. So this method involves separating the company into its various segments, especially for those large companies. Then you apply your different valuation methods like uh, like what some of the methods we used just now to each segment before summing up the total value to find the estimated value of the company. So this one, this method is suitable for valuing more diversified conglomerate type companies with different segments and subsidiaries. <coughs> yeah. Okay, so finally for the leverage buyout analysis. So what is leverage buyout? It's actually the acquisition of a company or a segment of the company funded mostly with debt. So this method you assumes that a private equity firm buys over the company. So what we do is we work backwards from the required internal rate of return, taking into account debt interest repayment, cash inflows, holding periods, then you find the maximum value that the private equity firm will be willing to pay. So this sets the minimum of valuation since it's the maximum amount that a private equity firm will be willing to pay. Yeah. So finally, we come to a conclusion that there's obviously no one-size-fits-all method, nor is there a best method. So depending on the purpose of why you're evaluating certain company, so some methods are better than the others, and it's also depending on the type of company. So um, with a word of caution here, so if the data entered into the model is inaccurate, so the garbage in, garbage out paradigm will apply. And finally, practice makes perfect. So after doing your valuation, most analysts will come up with this valuation summary. So the one we have here is from our two uh, directors, Ray and Hao. So for the valuation summary, this is also known as your football field graph. So the graph usually shows the valuation of the company based on the methodologies you use. So in this case, they use discounted cash flow and public comparables. So how do you interpret this graph will be, you look at the orange box then, that is the range whereby uh, you get the average of both methods, the share price between around $20 to $30. Yeah. So that's all we have for you today.